Have you ever thought about where your electricity comes from? Most of the electricity that you need to power your phones, computers, TVs, etc., comes from burning fossil fuels in power plants. Fossil fuels like coal, petroleum, and natural gas. Now you might have heard before that our heavy use of fossil fuels is a bad thing because fossil fuels are a limited natural resource and when we run out, we run out of power. But that's not actually the case. The reserves we have are not all easy to extract from the Earth, but those reserves are huge, enough to last us hundreds of years at least. However, there's a far more urgent problem associated with burning fossil fuels, one you've probably heard about, global climate change. We're actually releasing so much CO2 from burning fossil fuels that we are changing the Earth. So how can we solve this far more pressing problem? Well, one thing we can do to slow down climate change is to stop using fossil fuels for our power, which means we have to develop alternatives that don't release CO2. The only alternative with enough capacity to power the entire planet is sunlight. Now, solar panels, which convert sunlight into electricity, have become a lot cheaper and more efficient. But what happens when the sun goes down? Or when a huge snowstorm comes along and dumps three feet of snow on top of your solar panels? Clearly, we need some way to store the energy of the sun, to use at night or on a rainy day, something storable like fuel. So that's why scientists like me are working on developing a way to make fuels from sunlight. And for that, we're turning to the current masters of making solar fuels. Spinach. So how can spinach teach us how to make solar fuels? Well, you've undoubtedly heard of photosynthesis before. It's essentially the process by which plants make food from sunlight. Food is fuel for living things. So basically, plants are making solar fuels all the time. And if plants can do it, so can we. All we have to do is figure out how they're doing it so that we can develop technologies to mimic them to do it too. So you've probably seen the chemical reaction for photosynthesis before. That 6CO2 plus 6H2O gives glucose and oxygen, which is actually where all of the oxygen in our atmosphere comes from. You'll also notice that one of the ingredients in this reaction is CO2. Plants are able to take CO2 from the atmosphere to make their own fuels. They do this by absorbing sunlight and using that energy of the sun to combine CO2 molecules into higher energy molecules like glucose. In order to combine carbon dioxide molecules together to make those higher energy molecules, you have to make chemical bonds. And to make chemical bonds, you need electrons. And that's where the other ingredient of photosynthesis comes into play, water. So plants use water as a source of electrons to make those chemical bonds between carbon dioxide molecules. That is, they oxidize water. Why water, you may ask? Because it has electrons to spare, and it's everywhere. It even falls from the sky, for crying out loud. However, getting the electrons from water isn't super easy. Photosynthesis is an oxidation reduction reaction in which water is oxidized, that is, it loses electrons, and carbon dioxide is reduced, that is, it gains electrons. So to oxidize water, you basically have to blast it apart into its hydrogen and oxygen pieces, which is actually where all of the oxygen in the atmosphere comes from. But blasting apart water molecules is really difficult. It takes a lot of energy. Sunlight can provide that energy, but not without something to help it along, a catalyst. So what is a catalyst? A catalyst is a substance that can speed up a chemical reaction by reducing the amount of energy it takes to drive that chemical reaction. Now, plants have their own catalyst for oxidizing water, which they perfected over billions of years of evolution, that allows them to get the electrons from water without using huge amounts of energy. So great, plants have a catalyst, let's just use their catalyst. Unfortunately, it's not that simple. The plant catalyst can't work outside of the plant. So researchers have to find catalysts that are man-made that work just as well as the natural catalyst. The major challenge in making water oxidation catalysts is that water oxidation requires a lot of energy. More energy, in fact, than most substances can withstand without falling apart. In other words, almost any other substance is easier to destroy than water. We have found a few molecules that are able to do this challenging reaction without shutting down. For example, this orange solution contains a substance that can oxidize water when I provide it with a little push. This white powder is called sodium periodate. Sodium periodate is a high energy molecule. When I add these two things together, the sodium periodate will give up its energy to the orange solution and turn this into a substance that can do water oxidation catalysis and split water into its hydrogen and oxygen pieces. Now let's see it in action.
These bubbles are oxygen being released from the oxidation of water. And this reaction only stops when all the sodium periodate has been used up, not when my catalyst breaks down and stops working. This is pretty cool and is really promising for coming up with a strategy to make solar fuels for the planet. Of course, we're still not using this everywhere, and there's a very good reason why. Have a look at the chemical structure of this molecule. The IR in the middle stands for iridium, which is one of the rarest elements known to man, more rare than gold, silver, or even platinum, which means it's really, really expensive. So why are we using iridium? Well, because it does the reaction really well, and if we understand why it does the reaction so well, we can work on finding other materials that use cheaper building blocks that can also do this reaction really well. And that's something that we're working on really hard in my lab right now.